it's blinking. Does that mean anything? All right, we're in good shape now. For everybody watching by YouTube, we finally got the equipment up and running. If you've been following along with us, you know that we've been examining the revelation of Jesus Christ to the Apostle John, the senior pastor, if you will, of the churches of Asia Minor, the area now called Turkey. And seven local churches are addressed by the Lord Jesus in his glorified form. And though he speaks to those seven churches, he is actually speaking to every church of every age. And we said that there are different layers of interpretation. And those layers of interpretation include messages directly and applicable to the local churches that they were written to, all seven. And then secondly, ecclesiastically, meaning that there are nuggets in what's said to each of those seven churches that applies to all churches everywhere. And then thirdly, another layer in the message that are messages, things to be known by each and every individual believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then fourthly, the final layer, which is prophetic. Speaking of the entire church history, beginning approximately 100 AD, John, as he receives this, is in his mid-90s and terminating for six of the seven churches well maybe tomorrow upon the rapture of the church and then for one church the message goes through the seven-year tribulation period. We've also said that the final four churches have something unique in common, that the first three churches do not. The final four churches are churches that have elements in each of them, even though each of the churches is speaking to a particular period within that 1900, 2000 years, right in there. But elements, regardless of where they're placed in history, that continue all the way out to the time of the rapture of the church. To the church at Thyatira, it speaks of the papal age. Uh, the time of the Roman popes and the Catholic Church, around 600 up to uh, the rapture and into the Great Tribulation as elements of the Catholic Church being unsaved and being more of a political organization form the basis around which a world religion is formed. And we'll go into that in more detail as we go through the revelation of Jesus Christ and the succeeding books. If you recall, the book is of things that John, that John had already seen, things that are church history, and then things that are to come. Sardis was the period of Reformation from the 1500s forward. Philadelphia, from 1800, the church whose heart was set on missionary issues, whose heart was reignited, whose desire was to share the message of the good news of Jesus Christ 
throughout the entire world. Men like William Carey to India. Men like Hudson Taylor, the shoemaker, who found his way, or, 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 or shoemaker to India. And then Hudson Taylor taking off with virtually no money in the clothes on his back, taking ship to China. And D.L. Moody, a man with no seminary training, no Bible school training, and a heart for God who set the United States of America on fire for Jesus. Now notice that the last four churches that are spoken of in Revelation, elements of those churches are still going. Now we finally come to the last church. As short as the third chapter of the revelation of Jesus Christ is, you wouldn't think you could get this much out of it. Buckle your seatbelts. We're at Laodicea. Laodicea is the last church addressed by Jesus before the rapture. And it is the last church in the last church age that finds itself in the sequence of church history from about 1900 AD until just beyond the next minute to the time of Jesus' rapture of the church. There is one unique feature of the church of Laodicea, the church of today. Jesus does not have a single good thing to say to it. Not one. Other churches, Jesus begins with statements of commendation about the good things that they've done. And then statements of instruction and then statements of condemnation for the things they did wrong and, and telling them that they need to repent. The church at Laodicea, he has no word of condemnation or no word of commendation to the church of Laodicea at all. That's a pretty chilling thought. He has substantial issues against the church from 1900 until today. Let me tell you a little bit about Laodicea, the original church, and where it was located. Laodicea was, was six miles south of the church at Philadelphia, the church that was the city of love. The church was the banking center and the most wealthy city of the entire region. All things financial found themselves to Laodicea. The people were rich. They had more money than anybody else in the world. Sound familiar? While the rest of the world starved, Laodicea as a city was rich and filled with goods. They controlled the financial situation in the Roman world, in that section of the world. One of the features of the church at Laodicea is in their opulence, in their richness, in their lack of apparent need because they had plenty to wear, plenty to eat, they had plenty of housing. Anybody in Laodicea who somebody considered to be poor by the rest of the world's standards was rich. Laodicea was tied up in a culture of entertainment. As a matter of fact, if you go to Laodicea today, there is still an amphitheater there with 30,000 seats. 30,000. And Laodicea boasted that there was entertainment that happened nonstop in that Colosseum all the time. It was called the circus. Now, the Roman circus was certainly different than we consider a circus today. 
We think about dancing bears, clowns, and all that sort of stuff. They had nonstop entertainment because people had so much in the way of personal riches that they were constantly looking for something to hold their attentions. They could have been the founders of cell phones. Rich, and they thought everything of the entertainment industry. Another interesting thing was that the Laodiceans, because of their financial opulence, were able to do engineering projects that other cities could only dream about. There was an aqueduct that was built in the city of Laodicea. And it started in Laodicea's twin city called the uh, Hierapolis. And the Hierapolis had a very unique feature. The Hierapolis had geothermal hot springs in the town. And they engineered an aqueduct that would bring scalding hot water all the way from the Hierapolis into Laodicea and then eventually delivering that water to Colossae. But unfortunately, it was a tremendous engineering failure. And the reason it was, was because of the, con the construction of the aqueduct. It began as scalding hot water in the city of its origin, but by the time it got to Laodicea, it had lost most of its heat. And it, it was lukewarm. And then when it continued its travels, down the aqueduct to Colossae, by the time it got there, it was cold. The entire purpose for building the aqueduct was so that they would not have to heat water in Laodicea. They, had, they, they envisioned having running hot water for all the purposes that we would have running hot water today. But the reality was because the engineering was not correct, because they had misestimated the distance and the ratio of heat loss, and believe me, I'm gonna tie this up. The water that came to them was less than worthless, because if it had been cold water, it would have been good for circulating and keeping things cold and it would have been refreshing. And if it had been hot water the way they thought it was going to be when they were going to bring it into the city, it would have been good for all manner of tasks that required hot water. Keep this in mind. But because it arrived in a manner that was lukewarm, it wasn't any good for anything. It didn't fit the purpose for which it was designed. Keep that thought. Now, those geothermal wells still exist. The government of Turkey, that government now tries to extract the hot water, the, the extremely hot water for geothermal production of electricity. And the area is very much the way it was back when this was in vision, all right? Now, the city was known for one other thing. Another engineering issue that is not clearly understood. Most cities were built in such a manner that they were militarily defensible. Cities that were built on high prominences. One of the basics of military tactics is you want to be on high ground. Why? Because it's harder to attack uphill. Other cities were built where there were sheer cliffs on three sides and the only way up was on one side so that they could concentrate a defense and build walls so they could 
wipe out the enemy before they could make it up that one lane of access. Laodicea was built in an area that no military could easily defend. As a result, it brought about a political situation that was really tenuous. So the Laodiceans and their government became extremely adept at compromise. Their answer to any political problem with anyone who might threaten them was to modify what they believed and what they were willing to do in order to appease the potentially adversarial force. And it carried over into everything they did to include the so-called Christian church there. Compromise anything to keep from being attacked. Compromise anything to have favor with others. This is the church that Jesus is about to speak to. And the things that he has to say use these factors that were well known to the Laodicean people to point out spiritual truths about their condition. Water that was lukewarm, a propensity to compromise because in themselves they had no defense. So we're going to begin in the 14th verse of the third chapter of the book of the Revelation. And to the angel of the church, uh, to the angel of the Laodicea, to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. In that one verse is a huge amount of information. Every other Eastern Asian church, every other church that he addresses of the seven, he says something like, to the angel of the church at Philadelphia, Sardis, Ephesus, to the angel of the church at, he doesn't say that here, he says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. To the other six, he's addressing churches that belong to Jesus. To this church, he makes it clear that this church belongs to who? It belongs to the people. He's secondary. We had a discussion up here this morning about churches, great big churches with all kinds of social programs, everything else. The Laodiceans had become so accustomed to compromise over things that when Jesus addresses them, he makes it clear, I am speaking to a church that's run by the people. I'm speaking to a church that has decided what they are all about is what's convenient and changes from time to time because they compromise to meet what seems to be socially acceptable at the time to avoid conflict to the church of the Laodiceans. That term Laodicean, Leo means the people. Dosia, that particular word, it means rule. The rule of the people. In other words, 
if the scripture is inconvenient to us, we won't talk about that part of it. If the teachings of Jesus don't seem to match our society and what we think is right, we are not going to speak that in our church. It's where the original idea that everybody can have their own truth came from. Jesus speaks to them and says, I am speaking. Remember, he says nothing good to this church. He says, I am speaking to a church who has bought the idea that there's some other truth than I spoke in the scripture. Pretty pointed, huh? Then he goes on. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, these things says the Amen and the faithful and true witness. Now that sounds like a strange thing to say. These things says the Amen. You know what the word Amen means? So be it. So be it. Amen means God said it. I believe it. It is so. It speaks of the fact that there is a truth that is true whether anybody believes it or not. There is absolute truth. Without any other external intervention, there are certain laws of nature that are absolute truth on this earth. One of them is gravity. And it doesn't make any difference what anybody believes about it. You may be able, through mechanical intervention, to defy gravity for a short period of time. Airplanes do that all the time. But you will come down. It is going to come down. Yep. When I was learning to fly, one of the things the flight instructor told me, he says, don't worry about making a landing. He said, you will land. The question is where and what the airplane will look like when you get to come down. The goal of a good landing? For the airplane to look like it did when you took off. Not crashed. But you are going to land. In the 60s, numerous stories about people taking drugs. LSD. Who went to the top of tall buildings and sincerely believed under the influence of the drug that they could fly. They believed it. It was their truth. And when they jumped off of the building, a greater truth that was true whether they believed it or not drew them to their death in concrete when they hit the ground. Jesus is speaking to this church of compromise. And he's saying, and to the angel of the church of the compromisers, the Laodiceans, those that are run by everybody's individual truth, write, these things says the Amen, the one that gives the truth whether anybody believes it or not. It's still true. It's like gravity. And the only question is, do you choose to believe and endorse the truth that goes beyond human choice? And then he says, the faithful and true witness. In other words, what I am telling you is the absolute truth. I don't have an agenda. The only agenda I have is to tell you the absolute truth that will be true, was true before you were born, will be true when the human race finally is relieved of the burden of sin in their life and will be true for all eternity. It's a truth that is absolute. And Jesus now tells them, I'm the faithful and true witness. In other words, not only am I the, am I the AM, uh, the Amen, the giver of absolute truth, but I'm the witness of that truth. And what I tell you tells you that that truth is knowable 
and it is knowable by me. Wow. What a statement. What an answer to people who think that there's such thing as individual truth. These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness and the beginning of the creation of God. Now, sometimes you run into cult groups that try to use this very scripture to say, aha, see, Jesus is not God. Jesus was just part of the created order. And it says so right here. Jehovah's Witnesses love to use this one because they say he's Michael the Archangel. And they say, because it says the beginning of the creation of God. See, he was the first thing when it was created. Unfortunately, they don't know too much about John 1.1 1, 1, that says, in the beginning, there was the word and the word was God and the word was with God and nothing was made without him. What this is saying is, well, first, the Greek word for the word beginning here is the word translated to English, origin. Read that with the Greek word inserted, okay? The origin of the creation of God. Through Jesus, all things were created. He was not a created being. In the beginning, there was the word. Jesus is the word. The word was God. Jesus is God. And the word was with God. Jesus was part of the triune trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he now declares, I am the Amen. I'm the beginning of truth. It's absolute. Number two, I'm the faithful witness. What I reveal to you and what I say is beyond any notion of an alternative personal truth. Number three, I am the beginning of all creation. Why does he go through all this? Friends, because he's caught talking to a church that has been completely and totally corrupted by compromise. And he is telling them, you have no right, no power, no justification to tell yourselves or other people that there is another way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoever believes in me shall not perish, but have everlasting life. A belief in Buddha will take you to hell. Mm -hmm. A belief in any God that is not the God of this Bible. It doesn't matter if it is called Allah. It doesn't make any difference. If it is Hindu, it makes no difference what alternative it is. There is one way, Jesus. And that is a truth that is as certain as gravity. And any attempt to defy that truth only leads to destruction. Well, this church at Laodicea, they were rich, they compromised, and the reasons that they compromise, comp, comp, uh, compromise is because they had this internal need to be acceptable to the crowd, to the Roman government that was there in the city. Their fatness, their richness, the fact that they were tied into so much money and power became more important to them than the truth that Jesus had shared in all the scripture. And because that was their heart, they had lost out completely on the purposes and plans of God. 15th verse, I know your works. 
that you're neither hot nor cold. I know your works, that you're neither cold or hot. And I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I would vomit you out of my mouth. Isn't it interesting that he used something that they would understand about how worthless something is if it is not conformed to such a, a manner that it is useful in the estimation of the designers? They had designed this tremendous aqueduct to go from one city to theirs with all this hot water and their purpose was to use it for the tremendous purposes that hot water could be used, not having to expend any fuel, not having to build vessels to heat the water, to use it for their purposes, but rather to have that arrive in a manner that it was useful by their definition. And only to find that it started out in such a manner mm -hmm that it would be useful, but by the time it got to them, because the heat was compromised in the aqueduct, it wasn't any good to drink, it was lukewarm, and it wasn't any good to do the things the hot water was supposed to do. In other words, the water was of no value in light of the original purposes for which it was brought in. And Jesus is speaking to this church and he's saying, because of your propensity to compromise, because of your lack of willingness to stand up for the truth that I brought to you, because you have been unwilling to realize that what I tell you is the absolute truth, you have become worthless to the purposes of God. Oh yeah, you've been rich. Yeah, you got lots of people going to the church. And the reason you got lots of people going to your church is because you make every effort to eliminate anything that can offend anybody. You got huge cathedrals. Have you noticed that there are churches today? They never say anything about sin. As a matter of fact, they'll bring in celebrities that make the filthiest movies, celebrities that are involved in the most unrighteous causes. And they'll bring them in to church and have them make a big deal out of the fact that they've interviewed this celebrity. There are churches that are like 20,000 that are doing this stuff. And they bring them in because of the notoriety the celebrity brings. And then the celebrity leaves and goes out and makes another filthy movie. Why? Popularity is everything. Those are the churches that do not speak the gospel. Those are the churches that never speak of sin. Those are the churches that never speak of the necessity to repent and to make Jesus Lord of your life and to follow his teachings as a disciple. They are Laodicea. It's today. The message from churches like that, the last churches, the ones from 1900 to today, is the feel good church. It's the church whose messages from the pulpit are the messages of this is what you can do to improve your life. Messages that show you how to feel better about yourself. Messages to tell you all about how you can become a better person. Messages that tell you that the greatest sin is intolerance. And intolerance as defined as believing.